uh, between the two of them, uh, Corey and Melissa, I would almost guess know just about everything that there is to know about pharmaceutical situations in relation to our member population. They know a wide variety of different things. Um, uh, Melissa in particular has done a huge amount of work in the field of uh, alcohol use disorder, uh, you know, all kinds of different uh, addiction disorders and situations, uh, opioid use disorder. She's done a ton of meds ends on that before. So we got a lot of good uh, background and perspective here. And I wanted to just start to circle back. There was one question uh, that uh, Dr. Bertow had before about uh, diabetes and uh, alcohol use disorder. I don't know if you uh, remember that one in particular uh, that came across here, Melissa, but if I'm paraphrasing it correctly, uh, I think it was basically, are there, are there any of our medications that are typically prescribed, uh, whether there's contraindications when a patient has alcohol use disorder or in situations where the patient's just not motivated to quit or reduce? What, what does that bring to mind for you? Yeah, the, the one thing that it brings to mind to me, and this seems a little bit counterintuitive, but um, if you're drinking on an empty stomach and you have diabetes, it can actually lower your blood glucose. And so one of the things that we recommend to people who um, are regular or heavy drinkers and also have diabetes is to make sure that they're eating something um, before they drink so that they don't go into hypoglycemia. Um, and so, you know, typically we think of, you know, having beer, you know, would, would raise your blood glucose in a, in the standard person this does, doesn't always happen in people with diabetes. And so um, making sure that they're eating before they're drinking is really critical. Okay, excellent. Corey, any thoughts along those lines from, from the perspective of the, the formulary or anything that, that has come along that you've seen that you wanted to talk about? Yeah, a couple of things I would add. Uh, one, one's a little bit kind of outside the diabetes realm, but I know uh, coverage options for alcohol use disorder has been something that's been a, a common question, uh, has changed a lot at Care Oregon, and, and sometimes it can be hard when we make positive changes to kind of uh, keep people informed in terms of what those positive changes were. So uh, to my knowledge, uh, I think almost everything that's indicated for the alcohol use disorder is now covered on our formulary. So for a while, for example, a campus eight required prior authorization, um, that PA has been removed for several years now. Uh, Vivitrol is another one um, on the medical benefits since it's healthcare administered, um, but it's covered for alcohol use disorder. So I know not exactly uh, uh, in, in scope of the question there, um, but just a, a quick kind of advocacy for some options that are out there for alcohol use disorder that we cover. Um, I think another connection that, that makes a lot of sense uh, gets to one issue I was talking a lot about, which is patient specific factors during the PA process. Um, say there is that reason to be concerned about insulin and risk of hypoglycemia, and if that's exacerbated by their alcohol use disorder, that type of specific information and communication goes a long way for us kind of understanding why that, you know, the usual stepwise approach to our uh, diabetes pathway isn't really applicable to the, the patient. So that could just be some good examples uh, of the type of information and clinical risks uh, to be shared during the PA process that can help get some exceptions approved kind of outside the, the normal sequence of things. And I would just add one other plug, which is that um, Care Oregon, if you are interested in AUD and learning more about it, um, Care Oregon is hosting an alcohol use disorder learning series starting on October 1st. Um, we can send out that information um, following this uh, Q&A. And if you have any specific questions about the learning series, it will be five sessions, three are virtual, and then the, the, the last two are in person. Um, we're really excited about rolling that out later this fall. Excellent. And making sure you guys can hear me okay on that. Uh, also, uh, one other follow-up guys, uh, do we have, Corey, I think this is, uh, building on something you'd said, do we have like a link we can send out that's uh, the continuous glucose monitoring criteria? Where's the best place to look for that? Would that be within the normal PA criteria? Is there a separate document on that that we can push out for folks? Uh, yeah, it's definitely something we can look into to make sure we can push out. Uh, as I kind of mentioned, especially for Medicaid uh, and 
somewhat it's complicated for Medicare, but not really a pharmacy benefit. So that information does not reside within our usual PA criteria. Um, so kind of mentioned all of our formulary and PA criteria, all that's posted and kind of under the formula, uh, the pharmacy section of the Care Oregon website and all of the affiliated CCOs. Um, but since that is kind of under the DME benefit, that's going to reside with kind of how other material and DME vendor type supplies are managed. And they tend to work at kind of at a, almost a different angle, uh, kind of the no off required list. So kind of the default is, you know, stuff needs to go through PA unless it's on a list that says no, no PA is needed. Um, so that information uh, can possibly be a little bit harder to digest uh, in my experience, uh, but that's because I work in pharmacy. So, and I make the material that goes on the pharmacy website. So I think it's amazing and clear. Uh, so no, no shots fired to other departments. It's just my wheelhouse and, and kind of what I know. Uh, for the Medicare, um, there will be criteria that's up still kind of as that part B is in boy benefit, uh, it's just allowed to adjudicate under the pharmacy benefit. So for Medicare, uh, that criteria should be out there and available kind of in your usual pharmacy spot. Medicaid would be under kind of a, a DME equipment, but we can definitely check into uh, what links to materials they currently have up. Ken, I got another one here that I think this that's that's great. That's really, really, I think that's really, really good to, to call out. And this one, I think, builds on that uh, thing as well here, guys. Uh, sometimes patients get confused about getting testing supplies and insulin pen needles from DME while they get medications at the pharmacy, right? And is there any talk on... Uh, changing that benefit to pharmacy benefit? Is that anything that's ever been discussed or will it always be in two different hemispheres, you think? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, a common pain point. It has been a few years since we've looked into it. So I actually would like to take a fresh assessment. When we looked before, uh, kind of the bottom line is that same supplies cost about twice as much through a pharmacy benefit versus a DME vendor. Uh, I think a lot of that has to do with bulk ordering kind of resources. Uh, another thing that happens when it's part of that DME benefit then is essentially, I think any brand uh, is pretty much covered. Now there are some exceptions, I think for kind of special devices for um, if there's a hearing impairment, there's some really fancy technology that might be out there and available. So some of those uh, may not be covered in, in the same way, but basically if you're, um, one touch or a different type of test strip, it's essentially what's available at the DME vendor. The medical benefit doesn't have your classic formulary to say, oh, we only cover one touch. So that was one of the big drawbacks when we looked at this a few years ago, at the idea of well, should we bring it in under the pharmacy benefit? What that would require to be even close to kind of cost neutral or, or really just affordable for us to try to pull off was going to mean changing a lot of people into um, you know, kind of the equivalent of like a generic test strip. There's a lot of them out there um, and the different pharmacies will you know, put their name on it, a Rite Aid and a Walgreens, et cetera. So it was gonna come either at a huge price tag to move it into pharmacy or major patient disruption. Um, but we do understand that still the DME vendor aspect is kind of an ongoing challenge. So uh, I'm hoping that that can be something that we can look at and take a fresh assessment. Maybe things have changed there. Uh, maybe there's some additional opportunities um, that we could make that a little bit easier because we know in general, uh, the pharmacy benefit is, is easier to navigate through the dispensing pharmacies um, typically than a, than a DME vendor. But again, just really um, literally twice as expensive uh, when we looked in wow. past years, but we'll, we'll take a, a new look. Wow, twice as expensive, that's wild. And there are cases, you know, you may have a patient who comes in with, say, type 1 diabetes, they are symptomatic, um, and they need urgent um, testing supplies and, you know, needles immediately. Um, in those uh, immediate cases, we will make exceptions for a one-time fill at a pharmacy. And so, um, you know, if, if there's a patient in immediate need, we recognize that, you know, doing kind of a mail order of supplies may not be the best thing for the patient. And so you can give us a call, call our customer service number. We can make that exception for that one-time fill, and then you can get your patient all the supplies they need. Um, so you can get them trained on how to use needles and, and do their blood glucose testing, et cetera. Excellent. Outstanding. Hey, I had another one come uh, through here. Uh, oh, go ahead. Were you going to add to that, Corey? 
Yeah, Melissa's comment reminded me um, specifically, we were working to address kind of a hospital discharge pain point where they would have maybe the pen devices and the insulin's ready to go, but but now they can't they can't get their needles. Uh, really was, was kind of the main, the pen needle was kind of the, the front barrier. And so our formulary currently will have them on there and it requires just kind of a special code from the dispensing pharmacy to say, yeah, this person's being discharged. Uh, we can go beyond that, like Melissa said, with phone calls, but we tried to uh, address that one pain point of the insulin pen needles at hospital discharge that the dispensing pharmacy can just enter a code, basically then gives them that one-time override without having to call us. Um, so there's one additional benefit, but definitely calling us on, on other supplies in kind of those urgent scenarios um, is always going to be a good option. Okay, cool, cool, excellent. Here's one I think that probably everyone's got a question about to some degree. It's a little broader, but uh, the question is like about what we're doing at Care Oregon right now, if anything's in the wind or any changes to address access to care with the both the rise of COVID cases and, and the Delta variant, you know, encroaching now into, into Oregon. What do you see uh, going on that we're uh, implementing along those lines that folks should know about? Or that's that they we already have in place that maybe they're not clear on. Yeah, um, you know, one of the things that we have committed to continue is our um, telemedicine benefit. One of the things um, that Care Oregon did early on in the um, pandemic was to kind of increase telemedicine reimbursement to be the same as in office reimbursement. So that's not something that all CCOs did, but Care Oregon did, and we um, have committed to continue that um, uh, through the pandemic and, and potentially beyond. Um, and like I mentioned kind of in my talk, for some patients who don't have access to things like, you know, telephones, and, you know, making kind of telemedicine visits really challenging, we do have ways that you can get patients um, telephones. And so using our health-related services benefits, um, you can apply for a phone for somebody, you know, maybe in the case of, um, you know, somebody who is houseless, you can actually have that phone shipped to like their clinic and then they can go into the clinic and pick it up, um, get it charged, and then they have access to, um, to using a phone and using telemedicine. Okay, excellent. It's going to continue to be something that everyone's got prominently in their mind, I'm sure, as we continue to navigate all this. And, and then, add, uh, uh, yeah, please, this please. Morning. Uh, our pharmacist team that, that staffs the PAs, we, we typically meet every Monday morning. Uh, and so this morning we were uh, getting together and just discussing kind of what can we, we do? You know, sometimes there's a lot of knee jerk reaction of wanting to help and then you make changes that may or may not actually help. So we, we're trying to kind of learn uh, as in a way, it's kind of the second go around with COVID. You know, what did we do the first time that worked, that didn't work? Um, and, you know, what, what could we add to that? So, um, you know, where we are currently out of with 90 day supplies is probably one of the areas we're looking at most closely. So when COVID first hit, we had a very restricted list of what would have allowed at a 90 day supply it hadn't been updated probably uh, in a decade. And so that move to kind of a default, everything was pretty much allowed for a 90 day supply. Uh, over time, um, that's typically not been our preference just because of eligibility changes, medications change, um, there's a lot of costly stuff out there that if 90 days supply gets lost or wasted, um, you know, just a lot of waste to the system. So we tried to move back to a list that specifies which agents are allowed for 90 day supplies. And a lot of the, the diabetes stuff, particularly kind of earlier in the pathway, still allowed for that. Um, we were able to continue about 85% of the new use the types of drugs for 90 day supply, but there were still 15% that we just in the last couple of months when things were looking much more positive on the COVID curve, the COVID curve, um, then we would move to kind of a, the allowable list, but a, a much improved and expanded list. Um, but you know, now that we're kind of back uh, on an upward swing, that's something else we're trying to look at. You know, do we need to re-engage and re-expand kind of the 90 day supply list? Uh, another area that we're talking with our team is on PA renewals. Um, that's something our team pointed out has been particularly difficult. For the most part, if a patient's new starting on to say a new medication, then they probably were seen in office and kind of the usual PA process can likely proceed, though we're still monitoring that. But on renewals, we're often looking for recent chart notes to show how are they doing. Uh, I emphasize a lot on recent A1Cs, but now realizing, well, if 
offices are having to cancel appointments. They're not getting people in. We know that now there might be kind of a gap in access to that material that we would typically be looking for. Um, so we haven't rolled out kind of you know, some black and white rules in terms of how that will be operated, but that really has our attention right now on renewals because we know keeping people on their existing medications is probably one of the easiest things that we can try to do and not create gaps in care. So uh, again, still working through the details, um, but perhaps, you know, if, for example, A1Cs aren't available uh, because that patient hasn't been able to get an office recently, you know, maybe that is something that we will, um, at least in the short term, back away from or, or try to be a little bit more kind of understanding, certainly when some of that missing information uh, is there. So that's just something, again, um, literally just a few hours ago um, prior to um, this meeting getting started um, that wanted to kind of get addressed and, and see if, again, trying to make some really specific changes that really do have a positive outcome in terms of our patient access and, and help to our providers. Wow. And I'll just add one additional thing. We've been hearing from clinics that the kind of volume of testing has really gone up recently. And so that's taking away appointment slots for people who may need to get in urgently. It's really taxing providers. Um, we have been coordinating with our public health departments from the very beginning on vaccine efforts and on testing efforts. And at least in the coastal region, um, are looking at, again, working with public health to develop some mass testing sites that are outside of the clinics. So hopefully you will have the opportunity to, you know, shunt some of those um, patients asking about testing out, you know, into the, into the community, into public health, out of the clinic to allow you guys to continue your, you know, sort of daily work with, with patients, your standard work. Fantastic, fantastic. I wanted to, to try to reference one other question that earlier came through, uh, friends, and uh, I mean, it occurs to me maybe, Melissa, you're well positioned to answer this one, just because you, uh, you've you spoken in your substance use disorder work, you've spoken a lot about stigma uh, for, for patients in, in that realm, and somebody had asked earlier about something uh, a uh, program called Health at Every Size and the principles that go with that. Are you familiar with that in terms of uh, diabetes management and uh, you, you know, how those principles can be incorporated? Is that something you've run into before? Yeah, I know a little bit about Health at Every Size. Um, it's a program that essentially, um, you know, says that you you can be healthy with um, you know, extra weight on your body and, and that, you know, BMI is not a very good way of identifying, um, health. You know, my BMI says that I'm overweight, although I, you know, I'd like to think that I'm doing just fine. Um, and so, um, you know, you, you can be healthy at varying levels of, of BMI and at varying weights. It really is dependent on, you know, how much you're exercising, what you're eating. Um, you can still be a larger person um, and be a healthy person. And so I think destigmatizing weight is still something that we need to do um, throughout the healthcare industry, um, not just assuming that because somebody has a higher BMI that they may be unhealthy or at risk of, of certain diseases. Um, so I really appreciate that that program. I don't know much about their interface with um, with diabetes and how that that works necessarily, but um, I do think it's a great a great program. Awesome, awesome. And then uh, I know that we always get a lot of uh, questions about this in general. So I thought having you both here would be a really great opportunity to, to get you to give us your unfiltered comments. <laughs> on here, but what is in terms of like practical advice for our folks in attendance today when they're interacting with uh, the PA process, right? Are there, uh, are there things that you frequently see people doing either related to uh, uh, diabetes medications or other things as well that, that are kind of frequent, you know, uh, missteps that you, that you want to be able to advise folks they could do differently or, or best practices regarding PA that, that are just easily done, but just, but often overlooked. I think folks are always looking for a little bit more clarity and, and tips on how to navigate the PA process and, and, and make it work for them and, and for their patients uh, uh, in, in, a, in a more accessible way. Uh, would you mind both taking some, 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 uh, some time to just address that a bit? I know kind of a 
shock question out of the blue, right? I can go first, um, but I'd also love to hear what Melissa's had to say with her perspective and talking with providers, because um, I, I know that it's been kind of a useful conduit as we kind of hear the prescriber side of it. Obviously, I'm on, I'm on the plan side of it almost exclusively. Um, so of course, I, I bring kind of a biased view. Uh, as I kind of ended my talk, you know, really trying to highlight some of the, the specific things that I think would really help. If I had to be kind of the, the most straightforward advice, though perhaps not um, the, the advice everyone wants to hear is really maybe to, to lean into it and kind of accept the fact that, that PA and formularies do exist. Uh, I know it's easy to kind of rail uh, against the system. Um, it's certainly frustrating uh, at times, and, but I, I believe, again, my biased uh, perspective, you know, there are opportunities for us to both do better at it on both sides. Uh, hating that it exists is kind of wasted energy because I just don't see that going away um, because of how costs and, and the rising costs in, in healthcare in the US and drugs in particular. I just think it's really kind of a fact of life. So I think um, that providers that find ways to kind of be informed uh, and engaged, I know uh, a lot of teams now have specific PA staff and it's kind of what they do and, and help organize. So being kind of most familiar with really what the criteria are, are looking for um, trying to send in supporting chart notes, um, and really, uh, like I said, making genuine arguments, I, I think definitely uh, is probably the best advice. I, I mentioned form letters, general broad statements without specifics, at least for care organ, you know, typically isn't going to go very far. So back to like having that alcohol use disorder and saying that this is what they have and this is why this is not a great drug choice for them. Uh, we, we don't always agree, but I would say the vast majority of times that things get denied, it's when we're not really kind of having an apples to apples conversation. It's not so much that we disagree with you. We're just not really getting the facts. Um, now, uh, disagreements do occur. You know, sometimes a provider will say, I don't feel comfortable using this medication because of X. Our team can look at that and say, well, we, we don't necessarily agree with that position. But most of the time, it's just, it's, I would say it's probably more communication um, getting the, the facts of the case, um, the patient specifics communicated. So um, again, I know that's very easy for the guy uh, doing PAs to say, you know, if you would just hand this on a silver platter for me, um, then, then it would be so much better. Um, but in a way, I, I do think that that's kind of the way forward. Um, now, I, I may have mentioned uh, briefly that we are looking at EPA in our future at Care Oregon. There's still a lot to kind of shake out in that. Um, but that's something that's really being pushed by Medicare as a whole. And so I think that's going to become a lot more prevalent in the next few years. I think they're estimating that's going to be kind of a slow ramp up. But the way that basically can and should work, kind of two different ways. One is directly out of the electronic medical records. So when you're um, going to do a prescribe med and send an e-prescription, there can be a live check against that member's formulary could even interface and bring up the PA criteria right then at that step and walk through to say, hey, you need to have tried a sulfonylurea or pioglitazone. Right there can change behaviors, you know, kind of leaning into it and say, well, you know, sure, let's give pioglitazone a try. Um, by leaning in and kind of embracing kind of the pathway and, and the options, then there's gonna be much less barriers overall. Or uh, as I mentioned, if, if those aren't good options, um, try to have good arguments and discussion of why those won't work for the patient. So EPA has a real opportunity to present it literally at the time of prescribing, um, speeds up the whole process, gets more live feedback to prescribers. Uh, another version of that um, is through kind of intermediaries. So for example, uh, I'm totally drawing a blank and I shouldn't be on the, the main company that's out there. I think it's Cover My Meds. Um, they have kind of a forum now. Um, now we're not officially kind of engaged with Cover My Meds. So right now it's a bit of a, a platform between pharmacies and prescribers and then back to health plans. Uh, it's kind of a, uh, trying to think of a good reference. Um, it, it's, it's the Wizard of Oz. Uh, you know, it's the, uh, it looks uh, like something on the outside's going on and then behind the scenes, it's really just one person faxing to another person and it's far less sophisticated than it appears currently. But um, there are these platforms and as more plans engage with them, you'll get more in real specific criteria. So down the road, perhaps there's a, a chance, you know, these platforms and they're not all cover my meds. Uh, I don't get paid uh, by cover my meds, uh, even, even the slightest. 
so there are other ones out there. Um, and but basically, uh, getting kind of back to my main point, I think in the next few years, information on what criteria require uh, will be much more seamless to providers. And hopefully that will start to make a, a, a difference in kind of provider burnout and burden kind of on, on at least this area. I know for our prescribers out there, there's, there's plenty of reasons to probably be burned out right now. Um, but hopefully EPA could be one small way that we can start to shift that a little bit. And again, with that being driven by Medicare, I think you will see that spreading you know, more industry wide uh, over the next few years, though so probably looking more like five years, I would guess, before you really are seeing it optimized and heavily used by by many plans. Um, even for us, we're trying to get ready uh, for one one of next year, but still, that's going to be kind of in its, its very early stage. We've got to kind of work out the kinks and figure out how do we ask questions that make sense to providers. So there's going to be a real learning curve for us as well. Um, but we hope that that will ultimately help with kind of this this leaning in and, and helping kind of embrace that the process is there. And hopefully that ultimately makes um, things more successful overall. Paul, I don't know if I answered your question at all. I think I did, but I ended up on a very different uh, <laughs> tangent. So uh, it'll just throw it back to Melissa and see, see <laughs> where she can go with it now. Corey, I, I like it when you take the filter out and you just start free associating. That is my favorite thing. Okay, so you absolutely dug in there, brother. So thank you, thank you. But I know Melissa is renowned for always having a different perspective on everything. So we gotta, we gotta get Melissa's take on this, come on. Well, and I you know, admittedly don't do PAs and haven't in a really long time, but I do get to talk with um, our providers and hear what their pain points are. Um, you know, the clinic that I've seen be the most successful with prior authorizations has one person who does all of their PAs for their, for their clinic. And this can be really helpful just because that person gets to know the process and gets to know the criteria really well. So they know exactly what they need to be pulling from the chart and what information they need to be, you know, including in order to get that PA to get processed appropriately. Um, when you have every single MA doing, you know, um, PA, for docs, they don't really get that same depth of knowledge of the PA formulary and, and criteria. And so having one person be in charge of it can be really helpful. The other thing that I recommend to my clinics is if you don't like our decision to appeal it. So we have an appeal process. Usually those appeals go through a second review by a second person. Um, so it's like having another set of eyes on it. And in our denial letters, we will always tell you why we denied that prior auth. And so if you're seeing something in the denial letter, I always say to read them. Um, and if you're seeing something that, you know, well, you didn't try pioglitazone and um, the patient actually has maybe, um, you can go back, you can add additional documentation and then fax in that appeal. Um, keeping note, of course, that our appeal fax number is different than our regular um, fax line. And so just making sure that you're sending appeals in to the right phone number. <laughs> Excellent. We don't want any documentation or requests going into a black hole, right? We want to make sure they're going where they need to go. So that's great. That's great. Excellent. And, and then I had a, uh, a kind of a, a follow up comment, um, Melissa there with the, the denial language and stuff. Um, again, me being on a bit of a tangent, but perhaps uh, useful for the group. Uh, we've been actively trying to work and change our templates um, for nearly a year now with OHA. They've really slowed down the process um, like all government agencies um, like to do. But I think it's going to produce really good outcomes on the other side. They're really working, engaging with other plans. Um, there was a great session for actual member feedback, provider feedback, um, trying to help make the letters be more clear, which is a difficult task. You know, really, I say when we issue a denial, we're kind of trying to do three different things at one time. Uh, one is we're trying to communicate to the member first and foremost. And so that comes with a requirement from the state that our all of our language on the letter meet a sixth grade reading level. Um, so we're trying to speak to the member, advise them of our decision, why the decision, what their next steps are, like an appeal, like Melissa mentioned. Um, number two, we're obviously trying to talk to the provider, arguably the person in most power to make a next step for the patient, either to agree to try that alternative or to provide that additional information, um, like Melissa had mentioned as well. 
that can be a challenge because now we're trying to communicate at a sixth grade reading level to prescribers about their next decision. So that at times creates some tensions. Uh, we may have to overgeneralize language in an effort to try to make it member friendly. Um, so that that is a kind of an ongoing challenge for us. But that's why if you ever see kind of a weird thing of, you know, acne, you know, parentheses, red bumps on your skin, um, that's really trying to meet that sixth grade reading level. We're not trying to talk down to the provider offices uh, or diminish the severity of a condition or anything like that. Um, so that's, that's an ongoing challenge. Uh, the third piece is trying to meet the state regulatory needs. So in all denials, we have to reference specific organ administrative rules, basically the laws that say, this is why as your health plan, we are denying this service. Uh, and that can apply at a very technical level and they have their own very specific description. So at times it can be a real challenge to triangulate those three pieces to communicate. Uh, I think our team actually does a very good job here. It's a, been a real point of emphasis. I think we'll get better uh, once we get our new templates kind of approved. The overall letter will be much more uh, engaging and clear, more uses of tables and graphics and all the things that you would associate, you know, kind of with a, with a modern society, I guess you could say. Right now it is a lot of words uh, on many pieces of paper. There are many additional things we have to say um, in those. So it can be quite the novel that shows up. Typically there's about one paragraph in there that's really critical on the reason for the decision. And then another paragraph that's really critical on the appeal steps and options. Um, and in the new template, I think those just get emphasized more. They're easier to spot. You're kind of reducing some of the noise and hopefully will produce overall better communication to our members and our prescribers to kind of help set up what next steps might be. Are you hinting around, Corey, that we may be getting to a place where the we're going to communicate our denials via memes, something along those lines, more purely visual? We, yes, actually, we have talked exactly that, Paul. You know, just a, a, a frowny face emoji, um, the the multiple tier emoji for for just you know very uh, incorrect uh, or funny rationales that don't really line up with the request. Every once in a while, we get one of those that. You, you know, there's a misfire with the diagnosis submitted versus the diagnosis they're trying to treat. So that might get the crying laugh emoji. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely be seeing if we can incorporate those. Um, in, in like a like a, like a screenshot of Joaquin Phoenix from Gladiator, kind of like this maybe is the mm. emperor. You know, I think that's that's a, a hint that your denials, you know, maybe go appeal that thing. So, okay. I think I think our team's favorite are the memes of like the, there's a couple of them of like thinking you know there's math there's a pie symbol over here and you know a real complicated convoluted logic so sometimes that might be our denial reason it's very you know complex sometimes it might be a, a very confusing uh, argument that we we were unable to decipher so there there's a lot of untapped potential there Paul a cat with a ball of yarn all you know chaotic. I can, I can see where this is going, guys. So it's a, you're getting all of the behind the scenes stuff today, friends, that you normally would never have access to. It's a, a preview in the future and more. So it's it's great. I feel like, Melissa, you've been holding back that you wanted to, to add to this just a little bit, and, or, or you're you're done on this. And, okay, well, I'm checking on the, uh, the feed for our questions here, folks. Um, I'm trying to keep one eye on the, uh, on the time as well, because I know we're kind of coming down near the end of the, the line here this morning. But this has been a great opportunity to focus on this situation that we have. I mean, we don't really know. We're looking at all the, the data that's come across for, for diabetes and, you know, some of the negative outcomes that have happened during COVID. And, you know, here we are finding ourselves right smack in the middle of another chapter of more COVID as we move into fall and and, uh, and winter as well. We don't really know what the outcomes are gonna be or what the results are gonna, you know, transpire from that. So it's, it's, it's really a good time to kind of come together and just remind ourselves that, you know, in the midst of all this stuff, and like we said at the top, you know, COVID's kind of just been ubiquitous. It's eclipsed so many other things and it's sucked all the other uh, attention out of the room, but all these chronic diseases continue to go on. Uh, all the time. And we really need to make sure that we're putting attention towards that so that we're able to to help people get through that. And it's super challenging times to be in healthcare. And there's, you know, as, as Melissa alluded to, there's so much burnout 
happening right now. I mean, it's just, it's, it's for so many different reasons. It's, it's a super challenging time. So getting the chance to come together like this as we've been doing and just engage and communicate and, uh, and talk a little bit more about this and just get everybody's perspective about where we're at. It's super helpful. So uh, I know how insanely busy the two of you are on uh, any given day, especially on a Monday. So to, to be as generous with your time and insights and perspective, it's, it's a real great gift. And uh, I'm sure we're gonna get more questions coming through uh, our channels uh, after the show here today, but I know we gotta let you guys go at this point and head back to do your thing. So I'm gonna go back to our audience and take them through a couple more slides here, but I just wanna say thank you friends. And it's always great to be able to work with you and talk with you and uh, please do more Med Z with us in the future because we love working with you okay thanks paul i also want to say thanks again to all of our clinicians out there um showing up every day and doing this work i know it's incredibly challenging um right now i've heard some stories from from physicians that are just incredibly disheartening and i know it's hard to even think about you know process improvement and, and quality improvement during this time. And um, so thanks for, for joining us and for continuing to show up every day. It's really means a lot to me that you're um, taking care of our, our patients in this really, really challenging time. Well said, well said. All right, my friends, I'm gonna say goodbye to the two of you and we're gonna transfer over to just do a couple more slides for folks who are in attendance with he us here today. Um, I do wanna just do a little bit of housekeeping and we'll send everyone out into the, uh, the realm of lunch today, I suspect is on a lot of people's minds here. If you enrolled in Eventbrite for this uh, course this morning, you're on our distribution list for this and you'll receive an email uh, from us that uh, goes to all participants with a very, very brief survey to click on. It'll come from me. If you don't receive it, you can email me directly, Paul Carson, Carson, Carson P at careorgan.org. But that's going to be uh, how you uh, determine uh, getting your certificate credit for this course this morning. There's two different surveys because, you know, healthcare is complicated. For regular CME, it's going to be one survey. But if you're looking for like LCSW or social worker credit, uh, that body that grants uh, CEU hours for that has a different survey that they need you to fill out. So there'll be two different surveys. So in the email you get to me, I'll be sending you links for both, making it pretty clear which one is for which audience and which type of credit that you need. So just follow those. And if you have any questions, uh, just let me know. But we've done something a little bit different. Normally you only get credit for uh, med Z participation if you're here the morning of, the day of, the webcast and you've watched all the content, but this is an important topic. So we're doing something different this year. We've gone ahead and added another option to this particular program that you can let all of your peers know about who weren't able to join us here today. We are gonna have a recorded version of this entire program available as an on-demand CME option, what's called enduring credit through the same provisors, okay? So you can basically go through there your peers can watch it at their convenience, click a survey at the end, and they'll still be able to get CME credit. That's gonna be available for the next year through the end of August, 2022, that they can still get credit for this course that we had here today. So it's pretty cool. I think it speaks volumes about how much that we wanna be able to continue to put resources towards helping folks with diabetes in our community and our member population over this next year. It's a big deal. Transitioning ahead, one more thing here. Just want to make sure that you know, uh, we do have two more meds ed programs coming your way before the end of the year. The next one's just in a couple weeks. It is coming up at mid-September on the 16th. Uh, I've put a link to enroll in the chat here today, as well as, uh, as a QR code there if you want to scan it and you can go directly to the accent, uh, access for that as well. But it's on Community Health Workers, a phenomenal resource within the CCO environments that we have here that do a multitude of amazing things. We've been working with the presenters on this one for the last few weeks, getting their content put together. And I'm telling you, it's amazing what these folks are able to do and the resources that they're able to bring to help both members and providers and clinicians. It's really astonishing. So I think you're gonna be really amazed by these folks and uh, they can make a huge difference 
in outcomes. Uh, they're a real untapped gold mine of information and care. So I want you to be sure to attend that if you can. We're also working one right now that is gonna be coming up probably in the November, December timeframe on cultural competency in both illness and healthcare with a special emphasis on pharmacy. And uh, we, we talk a lot about the importance of equity and uh, bringing uh, a more modern lens to how we interact with each other, how we interact with our patients so that it feels that we're all able to be appreciated for the unique people that we are. Um, we're gonna dive into that realm and take a look at that in a way that should be pretty impactful. So we're really excited about that. That's in development right now. We'll get you more information about that in the weeks to come, but pretty exciting. I would actually look for an invite with more information on that within the next few days, because it's been getting a lot of exciting uh, exciting uh, attention. Lastly, that link on the bottom of this page, our MedZed webpage, if you ever go there, all of these patients like the one you've joined us here for today are retained on video for you to share with your peers. You don't need any kind of access link or login or passwords to those. They're just wild links to our YouTube channel. You can share those with your peers at your convenience anytime you like, uh, regardless of where they are. It's a wealth of information and uh, that content continues to have great value for our members and for all of you. So uh, just from uh, all of us here at Care Oregon, just wanna take a moment to thank you for attending here today. I know your time is incredibly valuable, but I think this has really been worthwhile. A special thank you to all of our clinician presenters here today and a particular thank you to Ian Youngstrom and Laurie Maori from the Care Oregon brand marketing and communications team. What they do behind the scenes to wrestle this together and to, in the age of confusing bandwidth and technology issues, to put this out here for us and make sure we have a great seamless presentation is unbelievable. Ian, Laurie, Daniel, all those folks just do a remarkable job for us all the time. We wouldn't have this program without their dedication and their creativity. So we're super grateful for them and for everybody at Care Oregon, for all of those on here today that interact with our members, thank you for everything we do that you do. We know these are incredibly challenging times and uh, our members uh, owe so much to you and we're so grateful for your partnership. So thank you for attending today. Have a great rest of your morning and uh, let's make it a great week. We'll see you again next time. Thank you and have a great day.